Feel New South Wales is in session. I'll take appearances. May it please the court, my name is Miss Donovan, initial O, and I am joined by my lovely chief, Mr. Wood, initial F, on behalf of the appellant, Mr. Robert Stephen Trevor. I will be speaking for 10 minutes, and Mr. Wood shall serve the second. Can I just clarify something? So what you're putting to me, if I understand this correctly, is that Section 42 operates something in the nature of a defence. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. As was discussed in the case of Theo Darakis, that in order to plead Section 42 or to include that as a defence to not only the duty of care, there must in fact be evidence of the lack of financial resources that were available to ensure, to ensure the safety of citizens. Well, so can I just clarify? That really goes to an evidentiary matter, doesn't it, rather than a defence, strictly speaking. Because what concerns me about your submission is Section 42 is in cast in terms as neither uh, principles relevant to the duty of care or to breach. So 
So are you saying that this is a defence properly so called? Are you suggesting that this is an evidentiary matter that it is imposed on a defendant? No, no, no. I was responding to the respondent's submission claiming that this was a defence. However, we are claiming that it is a consideration relevant to whether or not a duty of care was imposed. However, because it does not have any evidence to support the inclusion of Section 42, it cannot be used as a finding or the finding of there wasn't a duty of care. And hence, we are saying here that Section 42 does not apply and that there should be no defence. I now turn to 1.3 of my submission. Contrary to the respondent's submission at 1.1, pursuant to Section 42B of the Civil Liability Act, it is the general allocation of the public authority's resources that is not open to challenge. This court's 2009 decisions in Roads and Traffic Authority of New South Wales and Refrigerated Roadways, hereafter referred to as Refrigerated Roadways, and 2014 decisions in Pomeroy City Council and Baker. These cases provide that emphasis should be placed upon the word general in Section 42B. The use of this term establishes a distinction in that the specific allocation of resources within the general categories may in fact be challenged. In the present case, Mr. Robbins' allegations that the council didn't put up signs, attempted to relocate Bruce the Magpie on his neck, or shoot Bruce, are challenges to the specific use of resources within the general category of maintenance for public pathways, and hence are not barred by Section 42B. Thus, the respondent at 1.1.3 and 1.2 of their submission suggests that as a matter of policy, a duty should not be imposed as it will open the floodgates for litigation. We submit in the alternative that absolving councils of liability for foreseeable injuries would be detrimental. Residents of suburbs who use public facilities for which they pay council rates to ensure the maintenance of should reasonably entitle to expect that harm will not eventuate to them. Taking into account that no evidence has been provided, the challenge is to the specific, not general, allocation of resources, and as a matter of policy, councils should be liable for their failure to take reasonable care. We submit that the provisions in Section 42 cannot be relied upon. Consequently, it is open to this court to find that a duty can be owed, and should be owed. Turning now to my second submission, we submit that the trial judge erred in finding that the council's asserted lack of financial resources was the single determining factor in concluding that a duty of care could not be owed. For this, we rely on refrigerated roadways interpretation, that whilst the terms of Section 42 make clear that the matters to which are referred are relevant to whether or not a duty exists, this section is the supplement to the law of negligence, and whether a duty should be imposed is to be decided in accordance with common law principles. This conclusion that lack of financial resources should not have been the determining factor turns to my third and final submission, whereby we submit that the trial judge erred in finding that the council did not owe Robbins a duty of care due to failure to consider these common law principles. The High Court's 2000 decision in Modbury Triangle Shopping Centre in Ansell established that whether an occupier of premises owes a duty of care to those persons harmed by a third party while from their premises depends on factors such as the level of control over the activity and the assumption of responsibility by the occupier and reasonable reliance by the plaintiff. We distinguish from the result in Modbury, as in the present case, the council had significant control over Bruce, as they had the manpower, ability and authority to remove the threat from the public sphere, of which they would incur a minimal cost when concerned and compared against matters such as road work. Additionally, as Rona Park falls within the scope of the council, they implicitly assumed responsibility to ensure the safety of those who enter the recreational area. But for just Bruce or for any other wildlife that might pose the risk of injury? Because isn't there a difficulty here with indeterminacy of liability or floodgates, as you put it in relation to your Section 42 submission? Why just Bruce? Why not other animals that might pose a risk of harm? In the present case, we are, you're correct, just concerned with a singular magpie. However, we could compare this case to a zoo. They owe a duty of care to the people who enter their premises, not just for a magpie, but for whether it be an elephant, a lion or anything. And so we would submit that it could extend to that. However, on the indeterminate liability point, it should be a matter of public policy that individuals who are harmed when they enter onto public property should be entitled to redress. And we submit that this would not cause a floodgate of litigation, but rather ensure that councils would take reasonable care in the operation of their facilities, of which public residents do pay a fee for. But of course, the shopping centre in Modbury wasn't liable. No, we distinguish from 
of types of use usage and function of responsibility that was related to task forcing is over recreational areas and their ability to remove and own threats which is the disconnect. So it's probably there's more dangerous wildlife than people walking in the dark to flash your over them. Yes, Shana, however, on this case we are basing our submission on the fact that they knew of the danger and they did have the capacity to exercise control over it. And in that we distinguish the robbery due to their um, lack of control. Shana, I note that my time is expiring and I will respect it for two minutes of consideration. Thank you. Considerations in determining the appropriateness of impugning a link of duty between an authority and a local resident also includes knowledge and foreseeability of the risk of harm, the power to protect plaintiffs from the threat, and the vulnerability of the plaintiff, as was issued by Justice Alsop in this court's 2009 judgment in Caltex Refinery v. Cabar. The present facts also resemble the House of Lords 1970 case of Home Office and Dorset Yacht Company, and there is a direct correlation between the council's knowledge and lack of control over a risk and the harm that eventuated to the foreseeable plaintiff. Other features in favour of the imposition of a duty include that the harm is foreseeable, as over 25 complaints of serious injury were submitted annually. The nature of the alleged harm is quite serious, and the degree of control able to be exercised to avoid harm would be action on the council's behalf to remove a known threat. Additionally, the facts resemble an occupy and enter relationship, as there is no reasonable expectation that a plaintiff could take steps to protect themselves, and hence they are liable for the council's omission. Contrary to the respondent's submission at 1.3, in regards to evidence for imposing duty upon public authorities, as per the High Court's 1998 decision in Pioneer Shire Council and Day, councils possess a duty to safeguard residents from harm in circumstances where it is responsible for the continued existence of the harm, it is aware of the likelihood of others coming into proximity of the danger, and it had the means of bringing the danger to residents' attention. Here, the council was aware of Bruce, they were responsible for the continued existence of the harm, due to the failure to remove him, and they could have put up signs. As a result, we submit that this court should find that a duty of care was in fact owed by the council. If I can be of no further assistance to the court, that concludes my submission. I will now defer to my learned junior. May it please the court. May it please the court. Your Honour, I will continue from where my learned co-counsel, Ms. Donovan, left off and begin discussing the discussion of whether or not this was dangerous recreational activity with an obvious risk associated with it, as outlined in Section 5L of the Civil Liabilities Act. I will first submit that District Court Bin Chicken erred in finding, District Court Justice Bin Chicken erred in finding that for the purpose of the Civil Liability Act, the actions of Mr. Robbins could be understood as a dangerous recreational activity. I will then, following that, I will submit that Bin Chicken further erred in finding that the risk to Mr. Robbins was an obvious risk. And finally, I will submit that Bin Chicken finally erred in the assertion that Section 5L should apply to the case at hand regardless of those two points. As understood in terms of Section 5K of the CLA, we completely concede that this is a recreational activity. We believe that to be pretty straightforward and we're not contesting that point. However, per the phrasing of Section 5L, Sub Clause 2 of the CLA, it is clearly implied that the risk in question must be a risk inherent within the activity. If it is possible to not be aware of the risk, it must be a risk associated with the activity, not the individual performing the activity. As such, the court should disregard Mr. Robbins' heart condition when considering whether this recreational activity should be considered dangerous. In doing so, find that walking in the park itself, not considering the heart risk, a dangerous recreational activity, we would suggest would be an obvious gross expansion of this doctrine of law and would have, again, serious issues with opening the floodgates to millions of cases where this would be a serious problem and people who suffered genuine injuries would not recover at all. And then finally, and following on that point, we would submit that the factors that have been historically associated with making an activity dangerous are factors that have been associated with the activity itself. In the case of, I believe, sorry, Charleston Wallace, 
it was the act of doing of shooting kangaroos at night, not the act of those individuals shooting kangaroos at night. Though it does take into account some some factors surrounding the event going on, like their their drunken state. To expand that to include things like prior medical conditions and potential personal small things that can be triggered by larger things would again have a serious negative impact on this doctrine of law as a whole. Even if the court disagrees with this, that interpretation of section 5L sub 4 2 and considers that the defendant's heart condition should be considered in ascertaining whether or not the risk of physical harm was significant, find that any activity could cause a spike in adrenaline uh, should be considered a dangerous recreational activity would be to make almost all recreational activities potentially dangerous. In this case, the thing that caused uh, our client, Mr. Wayne Robbins, to have a heart attack was a spike in his adrenaline. If we were to say that it was a dangerous recreational activity because it could cause a spike in his adrenaline, doing anything recreational could cause a spike in adrenaline because it's not unreasonable to assume that a spike in adrenaline could occur at almost any, any time for almost any unrelated reason. Would it be considered a dangerous recreational activity, Your Honor, to be out and about on the streets on Australia Day and the fireworks go off and you have a spike in adrenaline in relation to that sound, which is something I wouldn't believe to be too uncommon. Or you're on a street and a bike whirls past you and there's a spike in adrenaline in regards to that. To consider all those things to be dangerous recreational activities would have hugely negative impacts for this area of law as a whole and would again open the floodgates to tons of people not, seek, not getting the redress they deserve, including our client, Mr. Wayne Roberts. Finally, we would, on this point, we would further submit that previous judgments on Section 5L have found dangerous recreational activity to be a pretty high bar to cross. Cases that have historically been associated with this are cases that are uh, involved the desire for high dangerous sports or other high risk activities, such as quad biking, such as shooting kangaroos at night, uh, whilst in an open top deep and driving around. Uh, flying small planes was found, flying small aircraft was found not to be a dangerous recreational activity. It was found that riding horses along cliff sides was found not to be a dangerous recreational activity. And what were the cases in which that happened? Uh, so the piloting a small aircraft, I believe, was Parisha Blue, Proprietary Limited, and Mayor Smith. I don't actually have them linked here, which is a bit of a mistake on my behalf, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> I had it for the original move, so let's stop this one. <laughs> Bit of a bad one. Um, and then, uh, but the horse riding one was definitely Alendin and Glenworth Valley Horse Riding Proprietary Limited. I figured that out based on the horses. Continuing <laughs> <laughs> uh, on to my next submission. Uh, we submit that District Court Justice Quinn <coughs> Chicken further earned in finding that the risk to Mr. Robbins was an obvious risk. Per the Civil Liability Act, Section 5F, sub clause 1, an obvious risk is one that would have been obvious to a reasonable person in the position of that person. We are not suggesting that being shot by, by a magpie in a park is not an obvious risk. What we are instead suggesting is that the extreme danger and extreme damage caused by bruises swooping in particular and the heart attack that followed from it could not be considered an obvious risk. Can I just nail you down on this point? So what precisely do you say? is the risk. So is the risk the risk of being swooped by the magpie, the risk in the spike in adrenaline, uh, or is it the risk of the heart condition materialising? What, what, what do you say is the risk for purposes of applying the legislation? So fundamentally, we don't believe any of them is the risk. <laughs> and we have said your being argument, we have and then, But in our argument, what we, our approach was to contend with both the idea of the uh, attack from the bird being so dangerous that it caused a spike in adrenaline and the heart attack. The, the swooping itself, we believe, should be considered an obvious risk. It is correct. However, it would not be enough to like satisfy it in this case, as the obvious risk must be associated with the thing. So doing the best I can to understand your submission, Sorry. we're talking about disapplying these legislative provisions, which is what you're trying to convince me to yeah. do. Is your submission that on any analysis of the risk, the legislation does not apply? Yes, right. Um, and it's not important to your argument how you characterise the risk, is that? Well, uh, obviously how we characterise the risk, if we were to choose to characterise them one way or another, would have an impact on our argument, because we're arguing, and it would have an impact, but we're arguing both anyway. Because Well, if you're, 
your submission is indeed that on any other analysis of the risk, the legislation doesn't apply, then the answer is that it doesn't matter how you characterise the risk, does it? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Your Honor, I think I thought That's what I was going to say. My bad. Sorry, Your Honour. So, what we would first say is that the, cardi the cardiac arrest alone clearly cannot be contended to be an obvious risk, as this would expand the understanding of what constitutes an obvious risk to become an overbroad descriptor. Does anybody who has any heart condition, are they always at an obvious risk of a heart attack? We would suggest that that's a faulty understanding of facts, because in this case, it wasn't as if he was told by his doctor, you might have a heart attack at any time, and you should be careful. It was, he was attacked by a magpie, viciously, that drew blood, pooping him three times, causing great harm to his personal health, that caused a heart attack. To consider it just to be a heart attack alone as an obvious risk would be deeply problematic. We further suggest that, that we further submit that the specific chain of events that led up to this occurrence should not be considered an obvious risk. While a reasonable person would be aware of the serious potential for a magpie to poop them in, in swooping season, it would be unreasonable for an individual to expect the severity of the harm that would materialize, given Bruce's nature as an exceptionally vicious magpie. For a magpie to attack in such a way is close to unheard of, as uh, it's just it's a very, very rare occurrence for a magpie to be this absolutely feral. And <laughs> that was not intended to be a joke, sorry. Um, and <laughs> Um, and in this case, those attacks were completely unpredictable to be swooped three times ferociously. Uh, one, one attack we contend might have been considered an obvious risk, but that's not what happened in this case. We would further suggest that the advice given by Mr. Robbins' doctor would suggest that a heart attack would not have been obvious on a morning walk, even during swooping season, as otherwise he wouldn't have suggested to him to go on morning walks and to follow your, and generally we, as doctors, while doctors are not sound legal advice all the time, on points such as what is a risk of a heart attack, they tend to be good resources. Your Honour, we further submit, uh, we finally submit, Your Honour, that Justice Binchicken was incorrect in applying Section 5L to the case at hand. In both Alemadine and Fowler to Morland, it was ruled that in order for Section 5L to be applicable, it is required that both the obvious risk and the dangerous and the, the obvious risk that occurred and the obvious risk present in the dangerous recreational activity be aligned. If you, based on that following, we would suggest that if you were to argue that the obvious risk associated with the dangerous recreational activity were to be the swooping magpie, the obvious risk that caused the harm would have to be the swooping magpie. If you were to believe that the obvious risk was the heart attack, the obvious risk that caused the harm that was like reasonably obvious to a reasonable person, the position of that person was the risk of a heart attack. And in this case, we believe that given our previous assertions, those do not apply. That concludes the submission to the <laughs> appellant, Your Honour. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that is bad. Don't learn from me, learn from Liz. <laughs> This case concerns an elderly man, aware of his risk of cardiac failure, who despite this, walks through one of many parks belonging to a newly established local council, where an aggressive magpie he knew to be prevalent in the area, unfortunately attacked him. <clears throat> on the first ground of appeal relating to District Court Judge Bin Chicken's findings on Section 42 of the Civil Liability Act, I will be submitting that his Honour was correct in finding that the respondent did not owe the appellant a duty of care due to their lack of financial resources. Your Honour, Section 42, Paragraph A of the Civil Liability Act makes reference to the financial and other resources that are reasonably available to the authority, while Paragraph B provides that the general allocation of those resources by the authority 
is not open to challenge. This has been interpreted by Roads and Traffic Authority and Refrigerated Roadways as meaning that the scope of duty for public authorities does not extend to allocating more funds to address a risk to the general public. Given then that any serious attempt to address the risk by removing the magpie would require the allocation of additional funds through paying removalists or putting up extensive signage around the park, these actions cannot form the basis of duty of care. Why do you say the signage would have to be extensive? Well, Your Honour, we would submit that for the signage to have a reasonable effect in actually mitigating the risk of the magpie, that the signage would have to cover at least um, a significant portion of the park to actually adequately um, reduce the risk to entrance. However, my learned co-counsel will uh, develop this point and submit to the court that um, this is actually an obvious risk of entering such a park, and I will defer to him to discuss that point. Looking at the statute, what do you say about the use of the word general in 42B? What work does that do? And how does that affect your case? Is your honours question with regards to paragraph B yes. specifically? Yes. Yes, Your Honour. <clears throat> your Honour, we would submit that the um, protection of public resource allocation is supported uh, by policy in the courts, and that is where this part of the statute has been derived from. We would distinguish from my learned friend's submission at 1.3.2 as to the specific allocation within the general categories of uh, spending of a public authority, and we would we would submit that this particular line of argumentation would be erroneous. Your Honour, we would turn your attention to um, Acting Justice of Appeal Sackville, um, as his Honour was then in RTA and Refrigerated Roadways, where his Honour in paragraph 405 stated that it could be in principle be wrong to apply section 42b by saying that all that is being challenged is the failure to do the comparatively small amount of work that would have needed that would have been needed sorry to prevent the particular injury that the particular plaintiff suffered however in this particular case we would argue that the level of specificity with regard to the problem of the magpie is so great that this would lead to indeterminate liability on the part of the council so affirming your honour's earlier question to my learned friend, we would submit that imposing such a duty would open the floodgates to significantly more litigation against councils in analogous fact sets, especially given that we do live in Australia and Australia is subject to many natural hazards. We would submit that the innumerable common features of the natural environment could potentially harm a prospective plaintiff and hence recognising this duty of care would give rise to indeterminate liability. But I suppose that's really going to the application of common law principles, um, which we, is the subject of a later submission I said that you're going to develop. But I, just to be clear, so here you don't, are you conflating the general and the specific here? Because the legislation really only talks about the general allocation of resources. What's put against you is that there could be a specific allocation of resources in respect of which you bear at least an evidentiary onus if I understand the submission that's been put against you. Um, in which case, Section 42B doesn't act in a sort of in primitive sort of sense to preclude this court from interrogating that. Um, that that's the case that's put against you. So what do you, what do you say to that? Yes, Are you are. actually here talking about a general allocation of resources which isn't open to challenge? what's being put against you is a specific allocation of resources. So specifically, Your Honour, then, uh, we res would respond to that question um, to say that allocating more resources towards the park in order to actually mitigate the risk of this magpie would actually affect the general allocation of resources of the council. We would submit that the council being a newly established council um, <coughs> with many responsibilities would actually require the council to divert resources from other areas of expenditure within the council, and that could include roadworks, signage, and um, other projects that the council could be running. And therefore, by diverting these resources away from these areas towards the maintenance of the park would actually constitute a general allocation of resources and hence should not be open to challenge. <clears throat> therefore, uh, continuing to develop the point um, from a policy perspective, Your Honour, um, we would submit that the role of the judiciary has actually been traditionally 
found to be unex um, it would be unacceptable for the judiciary to infringe upon um, the role of the legislature and executive. And we would turn your honour's attention to Chief, du Chief Justice Gleeson, as his honour was then, um, his judgment in Graham Barclay Oysters, where he remarked that decisions as to raising revenue, revenue and setting priorities in the allocation of public funds between competing claims on scarce resources are essentially political, and that when courts are invited to pass judgment on the reasonableness of governmental action or inaction, they may be confronted by issues that are inappropriate for this judicial resolution. And we would submit, Your Honour, that this current fact set, being a magpie within a recreational park managed by a council, would actually fall within uh, this particular definition. So just so I understand that clearly, you're not praying in a, that in aid of my construction of Section 42, are you? Is that going to general common law principles? Your Honour, we believe that Section 42B should be read alongside those common law principles, and that this the underlying meaning um, of the statute is actually informed by these principles. Right, but you don't say Graham Barclay is a case concerned with the construction of Section 42? No, Your Honour. Your Honour, turning to a more relevant case then, uh, we would turn your attention to the case of New South Wales and Ball, which was heard in this, in this court in 2007. Um, Your Honour, the court rejected the argument that the police service in that, in that particular case had allowed his unit to operate without sufficient funds or resources to adequately carry out its investigations or prosecute pedophile offenders on the grounds of Section 42 as it challenges a general allocation of resources. It is not clear um, in the facts of that case, Your Honour, whether the, whether the defendant in Ball gave any detail in its pleadings about the state of its resources, with a view to showing that it had drawn down as much as was reasonably available to it. And so, Your Honour, in response to my learned friend's submission, we would submit that upon the facts that the court can draw reasonable inferences that the council was actually under a lot of financial pressure during this time, and alongside the previous line of argumentation that diverting resources from other areas uh, towards managing this problem within the park would actually infringe upon the general allocation of resources of the council, we would submit that Your Honour have regard to this particular um, situation and therefore apply the principle under section 42 uh, to find that council was actually under um, financial difficulties and could not address this problem and therefore this court should not recognise this duty of care. <clears throat> Your Honour, these arguments must all be placed within the context that the common law has historically displaced, displayed resistance to imposing duties upon public authorities. And this means that the court should heavily err on the side of caution when deciding to impose a duty of care on public authorities to preserve the consistency of judicial judgment. And we would submit that therefore, Your Honour should find that a duty of care was not owed by the respondent to the appellant in regard to section 42 of the CLA. If there are no further questions, Your Honour, that concludes my submissions. My learned junior will now continue the case on the second ground of appeal. May it please the court. one submission on the second ground of appeal relating to the Honourable Trial Judge's finding in relation to Section 5L of the Civil Liability Act and duty of care. That will read that the Honourable Trial Judge was correct in holding the defence in Section 5L applied and hence there was no duty of care to be applied to the Council. I now turn to my first submission. We concur with our learned friends regarding the appellant's actions falling within the scope of a recreational activity and that the respondent is not liable for harm suffered by the appellant as a result of the materialization of an obvious risk of a dangerous recreational activity, but we respectfully disagree as to the relevant test. A dangerous recreational activity is defined by Section 5K of the Civil Liability Act as a recreational activity that involves a significant risk of physical harm. This has been interpreted by Justice Gipp in 
Salvo and Australian Austag Sports Association and ANOR as where the likelihood of both the harm and occurrence is more than trivial. And that is to be judged based on the particular facts and circumstances of each case, as per the case of Ballas and Morlis and Jaber and Rockdale City Council. Applying the facts here, Your Honor, the frequency of magpie attacks, at least 25 per year since 2014, causing complaints, many of which could have been injuries, indicates that the likelihood of their occurrence was at least more than trivial, especially considering the small time window of the year in which magpie attacks generally occur. The appellant was attacked in late August, which we submit is during that window. It can also, Your Honor, be reasonably construed that the harm was more than trivial, with the magpie's pets able to cause multiple piercings to the skin and draw blood. Regarding my learned friend's submission to the contrary at submission 1.2, the word involved in the relevant definition doesn't necessarily mean an inherent risk. Again, just as if in Fallis and Morlis at paragraph 36, states that many factors may make an activity dangerous, even though they would otherwise not involve a risk of harm. And activities have been found dangerous due to risks which are not always present. For example, the presence of low tide in Jaber and Rockdale City Council, and Strella and Albury City Council. In the alternative, your, honors do not, your honor rather, does not accept that line of reasoning. We then submit that the magpie would entail an inherent risk after all, as a natural reserve is certain to contain natural fauna, and therefore the act of walking in the reserve exposes the plaintiff to that risk. We would analogize the magpie in the reserve in this case to a nest of potentially venomous spiders, which could be classified as an inherent risk in any nature reserve due to the ubiquity of natural fauna within them, hence passing the test established by my learned friend. This is the heart of submission 1.1.4. But looking at section 5L, what do you do with the phrase, or sorry, the word dangerous in 5L, which operates as an adjective on recreational activity? Uh, again, Your Honour, we submit that as per Justice Ipps' judgment in Falvo and Australian Austag Sports Association and ANOR, that means that there is a risk involved in which the likelihood of both the occurrence and harm is more than trivial. So you say that that's where, how you would define danger, dangerous for the purposes of uh, that statutory definition? For the purposes of this statutory yeah. definition. And so is your approach here to the construction of this provision really disaggregating the elements of that concept of a dangerous recreational activity? Isn't that really a compound concept? It has to be understood as a whole. Uh, Am I not likely to be led into error if I disaggregate the elements of that phrase? Uh, we don't believe that's true, Your Honour. We believe that, uh, given we submit that it is indeed a recreational activity, and also that it involves danger, that is a significant risk, we submit that it can be classified as a dangerous recreational activity. So, testing the proposition this way, the appellant in this particular case was walking through the park for health-related reasons. And so he would then fall foul on your analysis of Section 5L. If he was walking through the park on his way to work, he then would not fall foul of this because at the time he wouldn't be engaged in the recreational activity. Is that the effect of your analysis? So, Your Honour, in this case, recreational activity as per the relevant definition in Section 5K of the Civil Liability Act, uh, subsection C, reads any pursuit or activity engaged in at a place such as a beach or other public open space where people ordinarily engage in sport or in any pursuit or activity for enjoyment, relaxation or leisure. Yes, but if he's going to work, he's doing none of those things. It's a propulsive definition of work. Uh, but, Your Honour, we submit that given normally uh, people walking through the park would be doing so in pursuit or, uh, uh, of enjoyment, relaxation or leisure, that qualifies the relevant definition. Yes, but what I'm saying to you and the consequences of your analysis uh, that if he's walking on the park for recreational purposes and gets hurt by a magpie, he would fall foul of Section 5L. But if he's walking to work, he wouldn't. Oh, perhaps so, Your Honour, but he wasn't walking to work. No, no, that, if the danger is supposed to be inherent in the activity and you know he's doing the same thing, but just for different purposes, might that not lead to an observed result in the application of the statute? Uh, I cannot assist the court any higher on this matter. So turning to our submission 1.1.3, another potential test of a significant risk is whether the consequences are material to the person harmed, 
as per paragraph 91 of Justice Ibb's judgment in Salvo and Australian Oz Exports Association and Amos. This is likely satisfied in this case, Your Honour, as the appellant was hospitalised and suffered severe injury and would likely not have chosen to walk in the reserve knowing the outcome. Notably, Your Honour, this test was held to be a higher bar than the previous, and even if you do not accept that this was a material risk, we still submit that the previous tests would apply. Regarding my learned friend's submission 1.3, we submit that there is a distinction between the risk of this magpie and other risks from fauna in a nature reserve. This distinction is evident in the magpie's aggressiveness in actively seeking out victims, its prominence in the park over the last six years, and the high level of harm it can cause, meaning it poses a far significant risk than, say, an ant colony. As to my learned friend's submission 1.4, we submit that the risk posed by the magpie was in fact more significant than the minor risks in the cases of Perisher Blue and Nair Smith, Stewart and Ackland, and Alamedine and Glenworth Valley horse racing, which respectively were boarding a chairlift, performing gymnastics on a trampoline, and riding a quad bike at low speed with constant supervision on an indoor track. Moreover, Your Honour, I note that the case of Good and Anglin found that horse racing was in fact a dangerous recreational activity at paragraph 166 of President Beasley's judgment, meaning it does not serve the purpose my learned friend relies on it for. Similarly, Campbell and Hay found that flying a small aeroplane was in fact a dangerous recreational activity at paragraph 137 of Justice Meagher's just judgment. I know I pronounced that wrong, uh, but hopefully you pronounced it wrong. <laughs> the only argument raised by the appellant to the contrary being the absence of statistical information, evincing a significant risk which is in fact <coughs> present at the case. Therefore, satisfying the relevant tests, we submit there was a significant risk involved in walking within Grosvenor Park in the presence of the magpie, qualifying it as a dangerous recreational activity. Turning then to our submission 1.2, section 5F, subsection 1 of the Civil Liability Act defines obvious risk as one which in the circumstances would have been obvious to a reasonable person in the position of that person. This is interpreted in Barry and Wyongshire Council as a risk where both the condition and the risk are apparent to and would be recognised by a reasonable person in the position of the plaintiff, exercising ordinary uh, judgement, perception and intelligence. This is judged in the context of the specific situation and specific plaintiff, as per Carey and Macquarie City Council and Strella and Albury City Council. In response to my learned friend's submission too, we submit that a heart attack as a result of a magpie swooping would in fact be an obvious risk to a reasonable person in the position of the appellant, and we would like to clarify that that is the specific risk which we deal with legally. Mr. Robbins was acutely aware of his risk of heart failure and understood that an increase in, in adrenaline would likely trigger heart problems, rendering the condition of harm apparent. The risk of harm was also apparent as a reasonable person would likely be aware of the magpie's existence and historical behaviour, meaning it was apparent that he would be swooped. This all means that Mr. Robbins could have chosen to walk elsewhere in the morning, knowing the risk of the magpie and hence brought the risk upon himself. Regarding their submission 3.1, an obvious risk does not have to be an inherent risk. Justice Bastin and Fallis and Mawler state that an inherent risk is one of multiple considerations used to determine whether a risk was significant, but isn't used to determine whether the risk was obvious. Again, obvious risks have been identified in cases where they are not inherent, like that of Jaber and Rockdale City Council, and Strella and Albury City Council. Hence, the risk of being swooped by the magpie was in fact an obvious risk. It follows that the appellant suffered harm from an obvious risk within a dangerous recreational activity, and hence no duty of care should be imposed upon the respondent. The relief we seek is that the appeal be dismissed and the costs awarded on behalf of the respondent. If there are no further questions, Your Honour, that concludes our submission. May it please the court.
I think there are any sort of oral presentation is an excellent way to actually test whether someone knows what they're talking about. Um, from time to time I've done oral examinations uh, and it's actually a very good way of testing ideas, testing whether someone understands something from the ground up. Um, best sort of, the best mooters clearly sort of understand the whole of the argument and how the argument fits together. Um, it's a really important skill, I think, uh, to actually be able to deal with, and normally there would be more than one of me sort of sitting here and you have sort of three people sort of peppering you with questions from all different angles, people riding different hobby horses. Um, it's a very good, I think, test for what your professional life as a lawyer is probably going to be. Um, in your professional life as a lawyer, people are, very smart people are going to be picking apart your arguments and telling you that you're wrong or pointing out flaws in your arguments. And even if you get to the High Court, you'll have people like me who make a living out of going, well, obviously the High Court is wrong on that. That's <laughs> for five reasons. So the earlier you sort of make your peace with the fact that other intelligent people are going to try and take your argument apart limb by limb, um, and that that's a fact of professional life, I think that's important. Um, it involves a huge amount of confidence to be able to get up and do this. Um, it doesn't become less nerve-wracking. If you ever talk to a barrister who appear before the High Court or the New South Wales Court of Appeal, it doesn't become any less nerve-wracking. Um, if you're interested in doing this, you can go down to Queen Square and watch the Court of Appeal. That's always fun, although it's not as feisty as it used to be. Or if you want to watch the High Court, you can, I was talking to a student earlier today, uh, who apparently watches virtually all of them, um, but you can watch you know, the High Court's hearings, you can watch this UK Supreme Court hearing. Um, advocacy, I think, is a really interesting skill to develop. Um, and the best advocates, you know, develop a style that engages the bench and is really an outworking of their own sort of personality. Um, for mooting, um, and, you know, you had a good example of this here, um, the question was really sort of a highly narrow technical legal question. It wasn't about facts, it wasn't about the exercise of discretion, it wasn't about you know, anything other than the construction of several pieces of legislation and then their interpretation. It was a legal issue in very narrow compass. Um, and focusing on the law and the research around that is incredibly sort of important. Um, and often when we put together a, you know, I've written a number of moot questions over the years, if you have a sort of very focused, narrow legal question and then you get people who start arguing about facts and things like that, it's like, this was a question stated or this was a separate question to be determined. There were no facts. So don't tell me about the facts. Concentrate on the narrow sort of legal question. Um, so working out what the question is really about, researching it, understanding how your argument works, spitballing the sort of uh, weaknesses in your own arguments, the potential arguments that might be put against you, uh, how you would go about sort of interpreting that, I think is really important. Um, it's not easy. Um, it involves, as these people will tell you, a huge amount of work. Um, but I think it's very satisfying and it's a way to sort of make sure that you actually know an area of law. Um, and I suppose it gives you a lot of confidence if you're actually able to sort of stand up and sort of deliver. Um, again, the bench will sort of engage with you and push their own hobby horses. The way in which you deal with that, I think, is really a test of your advocacy because really what you're trying to do is persuade a bunch of people that you're right. And you've got an agenda, they've got questions, their questions might be relevant to what you're trying to argue or they might want to talk about the point that you're going to make in three points time but you can't tell them to shut up. <laughs> Oh my bad. If we do get judicial officers to please don't do it that well. um, So you, you have to sort of try and guide them. You have to assist them. You also try to persuade them. They've got questions in their mind. Um, I think listen to the question. Um, so, so if you think about what had went on here, some of the questions that I asked uh, were thought about and they were occasionally assisting the person that I was asking, 
as opposed to throwing an obstacle in the way. Um, that's not because uh, the person up here has any partiality. They're trying to sort of think through the problem for themselves. But if you view the relationship with the bench as a hostile one, then you're going to go wrong because sometimes they're trying to clarify something in their own mind. They might point out a weakness in your argument. Um, the worst moots that I've ever had, <laughs> sat on, uh, where you've asked a question and you're throwing someone a lifeline and they're saying, no, no, our argument is something else entirely. And it's like, I'm telling you I'm very interested in this point and if you listen and thought about this, it's actually assisting you and you're throwing away a life raft while you're sort of flailing about. Um, always think, always listen um, to what's coming from the bench and sort of be alert to how that um, might have an impact on your own argument. So never think that the person is necessarily um, is necessarily trying to sort of throw an obstacle in your way. Um, also, um, if you don't know the answer to something, concede that you don't know the answer to something. Um, a very a practitioner uh, who is now at the bar and doing quite well, a very senior junior who was in my year at law school, um, came fourth out of four in an equity moosh um, because Roddy Ma was presiding. Um, and Roddy Ma asked a question, and he, the person in question, who I shan't name, um, sort of foxed for about uh, sort of a good, you know, minute with answers which were non-responsive, were no way responsive to the question, and then ended with a rising intonation, rising inflection. Did that answer your question? Like, <laughs> and Roddy Ma just went, no. <laughs> and ask the question again. And then the person had to say, I don't know. Um, if you don't know the answer to it, um, say that you don't know, or some formula along those lines. Um, on occasion, you'll, and I've seen this in a number of moots, a judge will actually just say, look, I suppose nothing turns on it. It might be something that's just occurred to them in the moment. They don't know whether it's significant or not, but they need to put the question. Um, so don't think that any question that falls from the bench is hostile or the end of the world. The whole purpose is actually to have a conversation um, and you're trying to assist. Now that's not to say that you won't have difficult people here. Uh, I've sat on some bench, well I've been a difficult person on a bench, but not as difficult. I, I mean I was perfect when that question was. <laughs> um, but I have seen uh, external people um, from the bench and bar, um, and they might treat this as if it were just another day in court. So, I mean, you're gonna get all kinds of people um, who will behave in all kinds of ways, um, but I think that's actually just the reality of professional life, and you will sometimes get people who are always sort of mean and grumpy, sometimes people will have an off day, but your job as an advocate is to persuade people on behalf of your client that your analysis is correct, and that's what you're getting paid a large sack of money uh, to do. Um, so if someone's rude to you, it's rude for a purpose and for a reward, I suppose. Um, but yes, well done. Um, are you going to moot again? You know, I've got to take four more. That's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wasn't that bad. It was, it was a new subject. <laughs> <laughs> if you, can, you can't be wrapped in new subject. Um, so yes, anyway, I thought that was very well done. Thank you for coming tonight. Can we have a round of applause for our gentlemen? And um, as Professor Rolf takes his leave, we'll just open up.